It's said that Thanksgiving is good and thanks living is better. Bottom line, thankfulness is one of the most important and most noticeable qualities of a true believer, and with excellent reason. John MacArthur shows you specific reasons you can be thankful, joyful, every day and in every circumstance. Stay tuned. The grace to you we give. If the Bible says to rejoice always, and that is exactly what it says, does it also explain how to pull that off? How do you be joyful and content, even thankful, in less than joyful situations you face? And if you really are supposed to rejoice always, does that mean that you need to be thankful for the mistakes you and others make? You'll get practical answers just ahead on Grace to You Weekend. Answers you can apply around the Thanksgiving table on Thursday and uh, the other 364 days of the year. John MacArthur is showing you what the Apostle Paul means when he says, In everything, give thanks. And that is the title of his lesson today. And now, here's John MacArthur to get things started. If you'll turn again in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, we're looking at just a couple of commands that are given to us in this very practical section. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Rejoice always. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is a responsibility to which we are all duty-bound. It comes to us in the form of a command. And in fact, people who reject God are described in Romans 121 as those who did not honor Him as God or give thanks. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, there were, as you might remember, sin offerings. Sin offerings were designed to be brought by the people as constant reminders of their sinfulness, constant reminders of the ongoing need for forgiveness, the ongoing need for atonement, the ongoing need for cleansing, the ongoing need for penitence, the ongoing need for righteousness. Every time they brought a sin offering, and they did it often throughout the year, they were reminded of how sinful they were and how desperately they needed to be made fully and completely righteous. But the Old Testament ceremonial system included not only sacrificial offerings that were meant to remind people of their sins, but also what were called thank offerings or peace offerings. They're described in the seventh chapter of Leviticus. And they were reminders that the people continually needed to be thankful to God for all His merciful and gracious provisions for their spiritual and physical needs. But they were to come, and as it were, by manifest gratitude to God, maintain a right relationship with Him. Now as Christians, we don't have a sacrificial system anymore, and we don't have any thank offerings or sometimes called peace offerings, so that we are celebrating the goodness of God toward us because we have a relationship with Him of peace. We don't have those kinds of offerings anymore. We basically have only one ceremony, only one sacrament that relates to this, apart from the one-time baptism. We only have one ongoing ceremony, and that is the Lord's table. So every time we come to the Lord's table, we are thrown back, as it were, on the sacrifice of Christ and reminded again of how desperate our sinful condition is and how glorious was the sacrifice of Christ to provide the sacrifice that satisfied the wrath of God regarding our sin. Therefore, that very same Lord's table becomes for us a celebration of gratitude. Remembering how sinful we are causes us to offer up thanks to God. 
And so the Lord's table is for us the focal point both of the remembrance of our sin and the expression of thanks. In everything, verse 18 says, give thanks, in everything. It's in the Greek, en panti. It has the idea of in connection with everything that comes along in life. It's just very, very broad. It has no limits. It has no confines. No matter what it might be, eucharisteo applies. That is the giving of thanks. Anything that isn't sin, obviously sin falls outside the purview of that command. As it does in rejoicing, we certainly always rejoicing wouldn't rejoice in sin, and in everything giving thanks wouldn't give thanks for sin. But apart from that, everything else should precipitate an attitude and an expression of thanks to God. In Romans 121, thanklessness is a characteristic of people who are outside the kingdom of God. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you probably should add this expression of man's fallenness. They are, according to verse 2, lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, etc., etc., treacherous, reckless. In all of the litany of what defines unregenerate people, right in the middle is thanklessness. The unsaved man goes through life complaining, going through life bitter, angry. His, um, his life moves along a path of trying to manipulate the world around him to satisfy the matrix of his own passions. And whenever he can do that, he has something to be happy about. Whenever he can't, he is entrenched in bitterness and disappointment, sadness. He thinks that some things are a matter of luck, some things are a matter of manipulation, so he works any combination of those things he can, trying to force into reality the things that he wants. The believer operates in a completely different world, a completely different realm. We can rejoice always because of what we know to be true about God and His plan for us, and we can be thankful in everything for the very same reason. So since we know that all things are being worked together by God for our eternal good, we can be thankful for everything. There is nothing outside the all things that are working together for good because God is making that happen. There's nothing outside those all things. Because God is working all things for our good, there is cause for joy. In the end, there is the same cause for gratitude. The early church made thanksgiving an essential part of their fellowship. It wasn't something that just came along seasonally. And I think for any mature Christians, any obedient Christians, any Christians who have a, a grip on... Uh, spiritual blessing, they would understand this. 1 Corinthians 14, 16, otherwise if you bless in the Spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted, listen, say the amen at your giving of thanks, without going into all the details of that verse. Paul is describing a church service in the early church, and he's describing some of the things that ought to go on and some of the things that ought not to go on. But among those things, he defines a time in the service when you give thanks. In verse 17, he adds, for you are giving thanks well enough, but because of other things you're doing, you're not edifying. So he affirms that a part of the early church service was the giving of thanks, and this was a good thing to do church engaged itself in being thankful. And it should be so since it is part and parcel of what it means to have a proper and appropriate response to the goodness of God. In 2 Corinthians 4.15, just building on this command, for all things are for your sakes. That's quite an amazing statement. God has in mind everything He does for your sakes, everything. 
that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Paul says, everything I do in my ministry as a representative of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, everything that God has me do, every ministry that I have, every time I teach and preach and every time I counsel and every time I bring the truth of God to you, every promise that I bring you, every measured truth that I bring you is from God, an element of grace spreading for the purpose of causing gratitude. Gratitude that abounds to the honor and the glory of God who is the giver. So you could say that in everything you give thanks because everything that comes into our lives fits into God's purpose to spread grace to us in a richer and richer way. Second Corinthians 9.11 is a promise and actually starts in verse 10, "'He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will multiply, supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. The same God who causes crops to grow and produce seed so that seed can be planted and more crops can grow, the same God who takes care of the food supply also takes care of the righteousness supply. He's the same God who multiplies your seed for sowing and increases the harvest of your righteousness. And then verse 11, you will be enriched in everything. God is going to give you everything you need. He's going to enrich you in everything, and He's going to do it liberally so that you can be liberal as you share and dispense these spiritual blessings. Why? Which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. God blesses us in order that it might redound to His glory and His honor, in order that it might produce thanksgiving. Again, in Ephesians 5, we find similar instruction. We are called upon to uh, obey. Verse 3, do not let immorality or any impurity of greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. In other words, you ought to live a saintly, godly life free from immorality, that's porneia, fornication, and impurity, which is a generic word meaning every other kind of sexual sin, or greed. Let none of that be named among you because it isn't fitting for saints. And there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, that's obscenity, which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. <laughs> that seems like a strange contrast, doesn't it? You should never be engaged in immorality, any kind of sexual impurity, any kind of greed. There should never be any filthiness or silly talk. Actually, the word can mean dirty talk or obscenity. That's not fitting. You be characterized as being thankful. It almost is as if he sums up a righteous life as characterized by gratitude. To live a righteous life, and I think that's really a very important principle. If you get a hold of this, it's very practical and applicable. To live a righteous life means to be characterized by incessant gratitude. Because incessant gratitude means that you have a grip on the goodness of God in your life, that you're literally swept up in what God is doing in your life. You have a Godward focus, and that's the essence of righteous living. That's the essence of, of godliness. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Go down in that same chapter, Ephesians 5 to verse 18. Don't get drunk with wine. Here's a, another one of these contrasts. Don't get drunk with wine. That's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. There were people in the ancient Greek world who believed that the way to uh, ascend into the transcendent realm of religious experience, the way to commune with the deities, the way to escape the low level of the world and ascend to the higher knowledge uh, was through drunkenness. As you became more inebriated, you sort of, in their view, escaped the mundane and you were lifted to loftier concepts. He says, if you want to be elevated 
to the presence of God, if you want to commune with the true Spirit of God, don't get drunk with wine, just be filled with the Spirit. Just as Colossians puts it, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Just be under the control of the truth and the Spirit of truth. And when that happens, you'll speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know what happens at an orgy when you get completely drunk. You might sing, but it isn't going to be hymns and songs that exalt God. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you truly are communing with God. You'll speak to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. You'll sing, make melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Characteristic of a Spirit-filled person and characteristic of a Spirit-controlled person is incessant thanks, incessant gratitude. That means you're under Holy Spirit control. So all these verses essentially are saying the same thing, really. It is normal for us, back in chapter 5, verse 4, it is normal for us to give thanks. That's, that's how you sum up a holy life as in contrast to all those sins. A Spirit-filled life is characterized by incessant thanks. And then verse 21 says, and be subject to one another, and wives do this, and husbands do this, and children do this, and parents do this, and servants do this, and masters do this, and he goes through that whole section. But the first response is joy, speaking to one another psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. When you get your spiritual life right, when you're under the control of the Word of God and the Spirit of God, when they dominate your thinking and your life, the first thing that happens is joy that comes out in praise, and then it's followed by and companion to gratitude. So you will always give thanks for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. You'll be thankful for everything. That's how Spirit-filled people function. I guess you could sort of sum up a godly person's life by saying they're full of joy and gratitude. Full of joy and gratitude. That's not a stretch. Because if you ask, what are we going to be like when we're perfect? What are we going to be like when we're in heaven? What are we going to be doing when we're in heaven? Well. We could sum it up with the same reality. When we get to heaven, we're going to spend all eternity expressing joy and gratitude. Is that not true? The purest joy and the purest unending gratitude. That is, in a sense, the summation of spirituality. It is a person who cannot be overcome by circumstances, cannot be overcome by disappointment in this world because they're so filled with the Spirit, controlled by the truth as to be incessantly thankful. Turn to Colossians 2. I think it's um, a high point of these verses. Verse 6 of Colossians 2 is a wonderful verse. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. What it means is, walk means your daily life, your daily conduct. So now that you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, pattern your life after Him. Verse 7 then says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him, you were rooted in Him at the point of your salvation, and now you're being built up, you're being edified, you're being sanctified, you're being established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. This is a command again. You're in Christ, you're growing in your faith, just as you were instructed. In other words, you grow in faith as you receive instruction about divine truth and be characterized as literally overflowing with gratitude. The kind of joy that we're to have is the kind of joy that is causing us to leap for joy. It's, it's the kind of joy that makes us glad. It's the kind of joy that we don't have enough outlets to express. It's that surpassing joy. It's that over-the-top kind of joy, and the same is true with gratitude. Uh, our gratitude is to be, as indicated here, an overflowing, gushing kind of gratitude. This is characteristic of one who is spiritually mature.
That's John MacArthur, president of the Master's College and Seminary and the speaker on Grace to You Weekend. His lesson today, In Everything, Give Thanks. It's shown you that even in difficult and painful times, you do have a reason to give thanks if you're a Christian. Well, with the Thanksgiving holiday just days away here in the U.S., if you're not hosting guests, you're probably traveling for some celebration. Uh, John, as listeners are scattering and gathering, uh, would you take a minute to pass along a few thoughts, perhaps some encouragement on how folks can stay spiritually nourished during their celebration? It is most likely that as you uh, travel and come together with folks for Thanksgiving, you're going to be with a familiar group, probably your own family or some very close friends. And sometimes uh, conversation can be kind of, dare I say, inane, uh, (laughs) uh, superficial. Uh, You can be talking about things that aren't really critical and maybe some old um, scars surface and maybe some old attitudes surface. Wouldn't this be a great opportunity for you to just go into whatever situation you're going into as the very influence of uh, of thanksgiving you be the thankful one you know make it your commitment sort of make a a little private vow in your heart that i am going to express nothing but gratitude wouldn't that be great for everything show your gratitude to the people around you show your gratitude even to uh, those who might be considered enemies of yours Show your gratitude in the end to the Lord for all he's done for you. Don't complain. Don't talk about the fact that you're not getting paid what you should and your job isn't working out and you're unhappy with this and unhappy with that and you don't like the way things are going in America and you're distressed about the politics. And Why don't you just be an overwhelming influence of gratitude? You know, the Bible says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. It isn't just thanks for the turkey and thanks for the dressing and whatever else. Just flood your environment with an attitude of thanksgiving. And watch how that will affect the joy of the people around you. And friend, let me also encourage you to contact us when you have a moment. Tell us how Grace to You has helped you grow spiritually. That's a way that you can minister to us as we minister to you. Please get in touch today. Our mailing address is Grace to You Weekend. Post Office Box 4000. Panorama City, California, 91412. Or send an email to letters at gty.org. Again, when you write, be sure to let us know how God has used the broadcast and perhaps an an article that you read or a message that you downloaded from the website, gty.org, something that has encouraged you in your life. Let us know about that. Again, the address, Box 4000, Panorama City, California, 91412. And the email address, letters at gty.org. And if you're new to the broadcast, let me encourage you to log on to the Grace to You website. I just mentioned the address, gty.org. Uh, there you can download today's lesson, along with 3,000 other sermons by John, free of charge in MP3 or transcript format. And if you're looking for a Christmas present, please consider the MacArthur Study Bible. It has 25,000 footnotes that explain the meaning of virtually every passage of Scripture. Order a hardcover or leather edition at gty.org. And now for John MacArthur, thanks for tuning in today. Remember that you can see Grace to You Television Sundays on Direct TV Channel 378 or watch online at gty.org. And then join us next week for another half hour of Unleashing God's Truth, one verse at a time, on Grace to You Weekend. <laughs>